In this video, I'm going to talk about the role of automation in journalism and more broadly as well, the role of augmentation in journalism. I'm going to talk about the um, development of a part of journalism called structured journalism and what that is and the role that that has in the newsroom. And I'm also going to talk about algorithms and related concepts like natural language generation. So let's start with data journalism's birth in robot journalism and how that's taken us closer to AI, which I'll cover in a separate video. I've talked previously about one of the most seminal pieces of data journalism in data journalism history, which is Adrian Holovati's project, Chicago Crime. One of the reasons why Chicago Crime was qualitatively different from computer-assisted reporting, which is, uh, if you like, a precursor to data journalism, is the way that Chicago Crime added a networked element to um, storytelling and a visual element. But a third quality of Chicago Crime was its use of automation. Chicago crime was automated in two ways. First of all, it automated the gathering of information from the Chicago Police Department's website. And secondly, it automated the presentation of that as well, the way it was mapped. It, it um, used Google Maps to automatically put those crimes on a map. And that made it possible not only for the journalists to spend their time focusing on the stories within the data, but also to help Adrian's audience as well do the same. So automation has a long history in data journalism and now we're probably seeing that um, automation, that, that focus on automation come back. Partly this is because there are lots of tools that make it much easier than ever to add some form of automation to your journalism process. One example of this is the tool IFTTT. This is a website, um, it stands for If This Then That and it's a website that allows you to connect different tools, different apps um, largely because of the APIs that all of those apps have. For example, there is a Data World app on that uh, platform which allows you to connect Data World to other services. So, for example, when you add a new file to your Google Drive, which is one app, it will add that to a data set on Data World. Or you can get a new email every time Data World publishes something new, and so on. IFTTT is one of the ways that I use to pull information from RSS feeds and publish them on Slack channels um, or pull information from one platform and publish it automatically to Twitter. So these are very basic forms of automation that are worth considering as part of your workflow. Now recently Data World has closed down the amount of um, applets, the amount of tools you can create for free. So it's worth mentioning an alternative to that, which is Zapier. Zapier is actually more powerful than IFTTT, but it's also, as a result, slightly more complex to use. But again, the principle is the same. You can connect different tools, different platforms, different apps, and automate repetitive processes. Now, in addition to using automation in our workflows and in our news gathering, we can also use it in our output as well. The um, tool Polygraph, for example, is worth showing as just one quite early example of this process. Hi, it's Noah Kunin with the Sunlight Foundation again, and I'm here with a great new transparency tool from Sunlight Labs called Polygraph. You can find it at polygraph.com, and it's a great and easy way to uncover influence connections in news coverage about Congress. It's really easy to use. In the second tab over here, I've loaded up an op-ed from the New York Times. It's about a bill that would keep people on the FBI terrorist watch list from buying guns and explosives. And it has a couple quotes, most notably from Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina speaking in opposition to the bill. It's got a quote from the Grady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence, and it also references the National Rifle Association. So we're just going to take the URL of the story, paste it right there. You can also paste in the raw text right here, and just hit submit. What's happening here is the site's going through and finding all the individuals and organizations noted in the article and finding out if there are any influence connections between them. Over here, we can see that the National Rifle Association has aggregated contributions of over 46,000 to Lindsey Graham. We can also see the 
party proportion of how much the NRA has given to either Democrats or Republicans, and the proportion that Lindsey Graham has received between individuals and PACs. So this is a, a really good example of um, automation as a form of output from journalism. What's happened here is that the journalist, instead of just writing one story about a potential conflict of interest in one politician that's speaking about a proposed policy, what uh, they've decided to do instead is, well, I'm going to be doing this over and over again, and, I, and there might be things that I haven't even seen that I want to perform this process on. Instead of doing that on an individual basis, um, this journalist has been able to encode that process in a plugin. And the plugin does a number of things. It identifies the individuals and organizations. So there's an, a, 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 what's called entity extraction here. Then that is looked up against some data which lists individuals and um, organizations and the money that has changed hands, the money that those individuals have received from particular organizations. And it's also looking those individuals up in terms of their political belongings. So there's a very much a linked data approach here in terms of linking an individual to a political party, to an organization, and being able to display as a secondary point here. So we're actually telling a story as well about these patterns that can be found in the entities in this story. And of course, the journalist who's created this plugin doesn't know what stories it's going to tell. Um, this particular example is one that's been generated by that process rather than directly by the journalists themselves. So they're able to do many more stories for many more people than they would have been able to do if they were doing this manually without this idea, this, this structured approach. The same applies to um, browser extensions, which um, are, are another way that this sort of idea can be um, that, that this can be done. So, for example, the Washington Post created a browser extension specifically devoted to fact-checking Donald Trump's tweets. What would happen is when you look at a tweet with this browser extension turned on, the Washington Post's fact-check of that tweet would be displayed to put it into context. Now, browser extensions are a really good way to get started with this particular approach and, and this particular way of conceiving of a journalism project. Of course, it's worth considering how that browser extension is going to be used and who by. For example, the um, audience that's going to actively install a browser extension may not be the same audience that you actually want to target with your fact-checking or that needs your fact-checking. Likewise, this particular example is a good illustration of um, some of the considerations around mobile versus desktop. Tweets are obviously going to be predominantly consumed on mobile, so the opportunity to use this extension is a bit more limited, um, given that most browser extensions are used on desktop. And bots are another way of using the same process. Again, essentially a bot encodes some potential interactions with data or with content, uh, and you write the different scripts or the different um, cases where certain information might be displayed or data might be pulled. And again, this can result in stories that you would not even have conceived of because it will pull data in ways that you might not have um, thought of explicitly, you've just planned for different permutations or you know different um, matches that someone might put into the bot, a question that someone might put in which might pull up related data. Now robot journalism more broadly takes this concept and obviously does it at scale. Robot journalism is essentially a process of applying a script to information which is predictable. So typically it's done with things like sports, um, finance, weather, where we know that, that these things have certain characteristics like certain teams or companies, concepts like profit, revenue, loss, um, goals for, goals against, and so on. And this predictability makes it possible to scale up the reporting beyond what an individual human might be able to do to something which um, creates many more articles than not only would be possible but also financially viable with humans. And in some cases a number of organisations are now publishing more articles from robot reporters and algorithms than they are by humans. Of course the, 
the, uh, there's a big difference between the types of articles that are being produced for the robot journalism articles tend to be very formulaic, standardised and short. Human written articles tend to be longer and more detailed. Of course, there have been a number of mistakes involved in this and some of them quite famous. There was a Norwegian um, robot journalism project around football which accidentally reported a player who scored an own goal as the, as the winner and the hero of the game. But actually that, that uh, anecdote relates to a, a story that was never even published. It was checked by an editor first. But the point about the football robot journalism is that it's not high risk journalism as um, one particular story about it says there's no big disaster that can happen with football even if the own goal story would have been published they would have recovered from it now I'm not sure that's entirely true but there's no big disaster that can ever happen with football uh, we can think of some very high profile examples but generally it's low risk as with um, reporting simple facts about data and even financial reports and and the error rate involved in robot journalism has been there's been research which has suggested it's still lower than the error rate with humans the difference is that robot journalism makes mistakes consistently which can then be systematically identified and indeed a lot of the um, a lot of the training around this involves or a lot of the journalism the role of journalism around this is to not just create the uh, robots create the algorithms but to maintain and monitor these now to give you another example of a mistake, um, which is extremely um, meta really, is um, a, a robot editor at MSN which used the image of the, an image of the wrong singer in, a, in an article about racism and in fact um, this led to allegations of racist bias. Now that itself is a, a, a useful story to illustrate some of the pitfalls of automation but also when that story was reported about the, the, the backlash, the negative um, coverage of that, that coverage itself was automatically run by the robot editor to the extent that the remaining human staff were instructed to stay alert and delete anything that the robot decided to publish which was essentially critical of the organisation itself. Now these processes have led to the development of um, what has been called structured journalism. This is the idea of a type of journalism which is focused particularly on um, structuring information so that it can be used by machines and algorithms. Johns and Johns call this writing for machines and, and their research into this expanding practice found that journalists were converting unstructured information into structured data to allow these algorithms to recombine it and reuse that content. They also identify some issues with this around editorial control, for example. So the idea that this takes control away from the editorial staff and gives it to the algorithm or indeed to the audience. So the choices made by the audience obviously feed into the algorithm in that case. Now, of course, the algorithm itself is, it is designed by an editorial um, person itself. So actually what we're doing is an, ed an editor through the algorithm is delegating responsibility to the future so there's a time delay between that editorial decision and the results of it and and that's what's worth considering when dealing with structured journalism is to what extent that responsibility is delegated to the future and who picks that up in the future if the creator of the algorithm is not present when it is used. Basil Simon at BBC News Labs talks about some of this structured journalism practice in some of the work that they've done and um, the programming mantra um, do not repeat yourself don't repeat yourself or DRY and he draws attention to the fact that in news work we repeat ourselves too often we do the same things over and over again when actually we should be encoding that and automating that and not wasting our time with those repetitive processes rather than focusing on others. That's really what's at the heart of this idea of structured journalism. We're encoding information in a way that we don't need to repeat the use of the same information. So, you know, what's the capital of France, for example, would be an example of a piece of information which should be automated. 
Jones and Jones identify three characteristics of structured journalism. The recording of data itself, so that, that can converting of unstructured data to structured information that can be read by machines. The recombining of that information, so for example, um, I'll show you an example in a minute, but um, combining multiple versions of a story, for example, or um, some sort of um, combined piece of information page. And there's, there's the reuse of that information as well, so using it in the future, not just in the present. So, uh, to give you a couple of examples of this, um, this is a process um, that's shown for the radar project from Herbs Media, which is uh, which involves taking data around, it might be, in this case, a health story, um, templating a story, and then generating multiple stories for different outlets. So you can see we've got here Bury News, Hull News, Milton Keynes, Portsmouth. They all get different versions of this story. That's what you would call recombining. We've, we're, we're taking a single piece of information and recombining different parts of that into different stories. We've also got the BBC's Olympics topics pages. These are automatically generated from linked data. Um, and again, you might call this recombining to create a, a, a kind of an aggregate page with lots of different information. Um, but also it can be reused in future when there's a new Olympics. This still, this same information can be reused again. I want to move on then to algorithms, which I've mentioned quite a few times, and some of the issues that they raise for journalism and data journalism specifically. An algorithm is essentially a series of decisions, and again, these are editorial decisions. They're not just abstractly made by a journalist, or by a, a computer script, I should say. These are decisions that are made in the compiling of that script and encoded in it. So an algorithm will encode decisions about which sources of data to collect. It will encode decisions about um, how to identify things that are interesting in that. So it, it might decide that we want to focus on outliers or trends or correlations. There will be some decisions in the algorithm about how to prioritize those um, insights. So we might make one thing more important than another. There's then a, a process of generating a narrative, ordering the elements into some sort of structure and story and finally the publishing of that story which again might involve decisions about timing, platform, um, whether it's checked before it's published and so on. So all of these might form part of an algorithm. Matt Carlson makes the point that these are not isolated actors that are deterministic but actually they exist within a network of communicative practices. So we as, um, as journalists are part of an institution, our employer. Um, there are economic issues involved in terms of it being um, feasible or profitable. And there are legal and ethical issues. Obviously, we, can't, we don't want to publish something that is going to get the company sued or damage the brand. And um, when we communicate as journalists, we communicate, our communication takes place within those context and indeed the algorithms are part of those communications. That's the argument that Matt Carlson is making. And the output of an algorithm might look something like this. This is an example of some automated journalism um, of the uh, 2016 campaign and what's quite helpful here is that you can see the elements in um, green which are synonyms, the elements in yellow, which is raw data, and the elements in purple, which are calculations, if you like. So in other words, anything that's not coloured is just template text. That always remains the same. What's changing here is, for example, the yellow elements are just pulled from a data set. So, you know, what's there'll be a field in this data set that says, what's the level of this poll? It's national. What's the name of the poll? It's NBC, WSJ. Um, how many said that they plan to vote for Hillary Clinton? 50%. How many said they would vote for Trump? 40% and so on. So these are simple data points. The purple ones are calculations made using those data points. So this number is not in the data, it's calculated by subtracting one number from another, 50 minus 40. This 
purple block here, Clinton, is calculated by identifying which number is higher. Clinton's number is higher than Trump's. And here we've got whether it's statistically significant or not within the margin of error. And then we've got the green sections here which are synonyms. So here it's pulling from a range of options um, rather than just one. So national, for example, is just one option. But Democrat, it could be could be former first lady. Likewise, Republican Donald Trump could also be businessman Donald Trump. These are different options from a list, essentially. So that's how um, an algorithm might result in a piece of text and how different parts of it are constituted. The background to that, the kind of under the hood script that is creating that, might look something like this. This is a, a script from uh, ARIA Studio, which is a tool used in a, in a lot of automated um, content generation. This is what's used by the Radar project, for example. And you can see the way that it's constructed is that you write a basic script, a, a basic narrative. So we've got some text here, which always stays the same. And then at any point where you want um, there to be some variability, you put that in square brackets. So you can see here we've got state. That means it's pulling the state column from the data um, for whichever state this story is published for. So this story will be published in, let's say, 50 different versions, one for each state, and this is going to have 50 different values and those 50 different stories. And likewise, it's going to pull the date from the data set and it's going to pull the city. But then we've got a more complex calculation embedded in this square bracket, which is an if test. We might have sums, we might have counts and so on. So you can embed calculations in this script as well. That's a very basic algorithm in terms of templated uh, automated journalism. This might involve what's called natural language generation or NLG. Um, this, this was made most famous through Microsoft's um, AI chatbot, Tay, which um, very quickly learned to be racist and uh, genocidal. But the reality is much more dull and prosaic. In fact, there's a number of different levels of NLG, from the very basic NLG, which is essentially a mail merge. So if you create, if you send out an email newsletter and it says hi and then the person's first name, that's a very basic form of NLG. You can have template driven NLG which takes a template and fits data into it. The examples that we've looked at so far, um, so this one and this one, are examples of templated NLG. There's not really any artificial intelligence going on there, it's just a algorithm, a series of instructions. On the left here you can see what the template uh, NLG looks like for the Norwegian football robot journalist and the different parts of the story and um, the phrases that are used there. And then you've got more advanced NLG which tries to uh, understand data and, and write it in what you might consider a more natural way. In fact, that's what happens in this particular story about the FT using a robot journalist commissioning them to write a news article. Today, for Robot Week, we are pitting one of our best journalists, Sarah O'Connor, against a robot, Emma. I've just commissioned Emma here by text message to write us a 400-word analysis piece. Meanwhile, upstairs, Sarah O'Connor um, has also been commissioned to write 400 words and she is racing against the robot. Um, Alpha just asked me to write the story. Uh, the data's just come out. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be slower than Emma, but fingers crossed I'm going to be better because otherwise I'm going to be good. So I've finished the story, I'm just going to add a few links and send it off to the desk. I will also print out a blank copy without my name on it um, to send it off to Malcolm, who's going to judge whether this is better than Emma's. So I have here Sarah O'Connor and Emma's two pieces in these brown envelopes, so I can't tell who's written which. I'm going to open them up and have a read now. Now one of them looks much more like 400 words than the other one. 
And unlike this piece, we've got some quotes in this piece. It's also got a spelling mistake in it. I mean, I would guess that this pithy, uh, on the money sort of news analysis, I'm going to guess that that is Sarah O'Connor's piece. And I'm going to guess that this slightly longer piece is by Emma the Computer. Um, what I would say is that um, it's slightly less elegant in the writing, and also that it's absolutely stuffed with numbers. And I think one of the key things that we try and do here is to pick out the important numbers. Here we go, on the money. Sarah O'Connor is indeed B, as I said, and Emma the Computer is A. Did you think I picked you out against the robot? I really hope you did, otherwise I'm still employed. Happily, you are still employed at the FD. So a few things to pick out there. It's no surprise that it's less elegant, it's less pithy than the human, but um, the robot journalism crams it with numbers. There's, there's a certain element of selection that's involved in journalism, which uh, we'll come back to. But um, also in this case, we're giving the, the algorithm an input, which is a, a data set, and it, it then um, has learned uh, in ways that we'll cover in a separate video um, around how learning happens with artificial intelligence, but it's learned how to write articles about information and, and what it's done is, is turned those numbers into a text summary. So that's an example of a more advanced um, natural language generation. Of course, when we use these sorts of technologies, we're not replacing ourselves with computers any more than pianos replace pianists. They become our tools, our pens. So as, as um, Ross Goldwyn, Goodwin sorry, points out in some of the research that he's done around automation as well, really what we're talking about is a new tool and how do we use that tool rather than the tool being inherently good or bad. One thing that research on automation has found in algorithms is that the more complexity that's involved, the more likely that errors occur. Um, often in the projects that were looked at, the effort needed for quality control and troubleshooting is underestimated. In fact, you need to redirect the effort of the journalists from creating stories or creating algorithms towards monitoring it. And also, the most common reason for those errors was errors in the underlying data. If there's garbage in, then there's going to be garbage out. That is the case, as always, with data journalism. You can't rely on the data itself being inherently always 100% true. A couple of other points to think about with algorithms are, are from Mark Carlson's research. Um, he makes some really useful points about how algorithmic journalism changes the nature of journalism itself. So first of all, there's an argument that all of this really is a response to economic imperatives rather than normative ones. We're exploring, many news organisations are exploring these technologies not because they think it's going to make for better journalism, but because it's going to help journalism survive, which of course is itself a normative imperative to some extent, but the idea is that we want to be able to produce more content and make more money, or at least make enough money to be viable financially. It's not necessarily about um, doing great journalism. There's an argument that algorithmic journalism has the potential to inhibit collective outrage. In other words, if we're going to produce 500 articles instead of one, then our audience does not get a collective experience. They're not all reading the same story. They're reading personalised or individualised versions which have been customised through an algorithmic process. And Carlson also attracts attention or draws attention to the way that algorithmic um, journalism basically supports an acknowledgement of subjective judgment. In other words, it admits that journalism is subjective. What we're saying is that an algorithm is going to be more objective than we are. There's an implicit acknowledgement of our subjectivity in the way that we outsource the process to an algorithm. That's Carlson's argument anyway. It reconfigures the journalist audience relationship. And also it allows for the scrutiny of that because once we encode that journalistic process we essentially say you can see how the story is made. 
And there are some other reconfigurations as well. So it was previously the case that constraints made news finite. We only had a certain number of journalists and a certain amount of space to publish into. Of course, the space constraint went with the invention of uh, the web and the use of online publishing. We no longer had to limit ourselves to the space and time of the broadcast or the publication. And now with automation, the labor constraints become stretched as well. So the idea of journalists' role being the selection of what is important, that gets challenged as well because instead of saying we've chosen the most important angle to write on or the most important game to report on or company to highlight, algorithmic processes mean we can show all the games, all the stories about all the companies and so on. So that selection disappears. And of course we've got that economic logic again in terms of the long tail. We're talking about lots of articles read by very few people rather than fewer articles read by more people. So just some key points to draw there. First of all, the idea that automation can be a process within data journalism or indeed it can be a product of it. We can create automated tools for our audiences like plugins, extensions, bots and so on. Um, and of course it can be the whole of that or it can be part of that. It can be just part of our process or it can be the whole of that process. Secondly, we've looked at the development of structured journalism as a new skill set in the industry. Indeed, the people working at Radar are essentially structured journalists taking data and putting it in a format that can be used algorithmically. That has led to some challenges to journalism's concept of itself. For example, the idea of it being objective, the idea of our role being one of selection, the idea of us creating a sort of a universal story, the first draft of history that our audience experiences as a single community. But related to this are new opportunities to see new ways of doing things. As soon as we start to codify what we do as journalists, that allows us to more easily see, well, actually should we do things that way? Are there different ways to do our journalism?